Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'll be talking about some work that I did while I was at Microsoft Research uh, in the fall for sabbatical. Uh, it's joint work with Eric Horvitz, uh, Moises Goldschmidt, and a number of other folks uh, at MSR. I'm uh, just just taken a position as uh, the head of the marketplace optimization team uh, at Uber, and also uh, am a professor at, at Cornell. So I'll be talking today about methods for predicting the reliability of driving time on a road network. And the main applications uh, are in the area of uh, mapping services like Google Maps, Waze, and Bing Maps, and also for uh, decision support systems for fleets of vehicles. Okay, You can think of ambulance fleets or uh, fleets of delivery vehicles or uh, Uber's vehicle fleet, for example. So uh, these uh, mapping services, as you're, as you're probably familiar with, provide uh, predictions of driving time from an origin to a destination in a road map, and they give that as a deterministic prediction of, of driving time. Okay, so just a single number. Here, 18 minutes to go from, uh, to go from Microsoft's uh, headquarters to uh, downtown Seattle. They, they use these predictions of driving time in order to recommend a route that has low predicted driving time. There's a large number of companies other than these mapping services that use these driving time predictions, however. Um, for example, any kind of delivery service like Amazon, UPS, or FedEx, plus the ride-sharing services like Uber and its competitors, uh, trucking companies like Conway Freight, and more. But these deterministic predictions, which are the current state of the art, are never perfectly accurate, right? And in the travel time context, the sources of uncertainty include uh, uncertainty in traffic conditions, unexpected weather conditions, uh, and also the fact that we don't know the precise scheduling of the traffic, the traffic uh, signals. If we do have accurate probabilistic forecasts of driving time for arbitrary routes in the road network at arbitrary future times, we can use that in decision making, right? So we can use that in decision support systems uh, for fleet vehicles. We can use it for routing in a more risk averse way. So instead of proposing the route that has the smallest expected driving time, the current state of the art, we can think about proposing the route that, that minimizes, say, the 90th percentile of driving time. So a more conservative uh, route selection. We can also attempt to report the driving time reliability to a user. For example, we can give them a range for driving times. Or if we if we think that giving them a, sim a single number is important in terms of the simplicity of the user interface, we can choose how conservative that number is. So instead of just giving them the expected value, which is the current practice, we can give them the 80th percentile. We're probably not going to try to explain that that's the 80th percentile, but the way that it would be experienced is a more conservative prediction of driving time. Uh, the important problem is that once you get there, you have to park. So you want that maybe at the end of your time, you will keep that information. Ah, interesting. Yeah, so, so maybe uh, more. Yeah, in fact, this comes uh, particularly important in the context of some of these fleet vehicles, like delivery services. There's actually a long uh, time that's actually the delivery time at the end. And they have to come up with methods to predict not just the driving time, but then also the last step where they're actually delivering the package. data that I'll focus on is uh, location data for users of mobile phones. Uh, we have had access to anonymized uh, Windows Phone GPS locations, and we focused in particular on the Seattle metropolitan region. But this source, location data for mobile phones, is now uh, quite ubiquitous. There's many, many companies that have access to large volumes of this type of data. Uh, and also, it's the only source of information that's currently available that provides near comprehensive coverage of traffic conditions on road networks. And additionally, there's increasing evidence that we can accurately estimate traffic conditions using only this source of data. So that's why I'll focus so much on this uh, mobile phone location data. And here I'm illustrating 
the Windows phone location data that we were working with, I've aggregated into uh, small spatial grid boxes and colored according to the average measured GPS speed. So orange here is the slowest average speed and blue is the highest speed. And you can see that we're able to discover that highways are faster than driving in downtown Seattle, for example. So the way this works is that on a Windows phone, for example, when an application on the phone accesses the GPS information, uh, the operating system also has access to that location reading. And that's why uh, Microsoft, for example, has access to large amounts of this GPS information. But that application uh, can be, uh, for example, a mapping application like Google Maps or Waze or Bing Maps uh, on the phone. The time between the measurements is typically between 1 and 90 seconds for the data source that we'll focus on. And in particular, now notice that the, the mobile phone is not necessarily in a moving vehicle when we get a reading, right? The person might be sitting in their office or at home. And so we have to actually isolate the periods of time in which the, the person's taking a, a trip in a motorized vehicle. And so we have a set of heuristics that we use to do that. They appear to be fairly accurate. For example, we seem to be eliminating almost all of the uh, bike trips and, and uh, running trips and so on. Uh, by using just a simple set of heuristics to try to isolate these, these periods of time when people are actually driving. Well, once we do this, we have 150,000 trips in the Seattle metropolitan region in our data set uh, that have distance at least three kilometers. So here's a few examples. This is in the Redmond region, and I'm focusing on three particular trips. And here we have one vehicle going south on Highway 405, and then two vehicles, black is a second, um, uh, trip and green is a third trip, and the, the points are each of the GPS readings along with an arrow showing the direction and speed. Um, this vehicle has gone north and then headed east and then doubled back on itself, for example. So the goal here is to use location data from mobile phones to predict the probability distribution of driving time on an arbitrary route in the road network at an arbitrary future time. Okay. The challenges here are that we have a very large number of possible routes in, in a road network of a reasonable size. So say in the Seattle metropolitan region, we can't possibly enumerate all of the routes in the road network. And certainly, if we wanted to focus on trips that have taken exactly the route that we're interested in, there would be very few or no trips that have precisely the route of interest. Okay, although there may, may be many trips that use particular roads uh, that are included in that route. So we'll try to use that idea. Okay, and of course, driving time depends on the time of the week, the traffic conditions, and lots of other effects. Yes? It's not real time. It's not that right now I want to take a trip and you're looking at all other users. It's, it's, it's not a real time for so our, our method does not do real-time prediction, and there's actually a practical reason for that. But uh, what we do take into account is we take into account weekly cycles and congestion. So that is the biggest effect in this, in this type of data. Um, but we're not taking into account, uh, we're not adjusting that according to our real-time information about traffic conditions. And that's basically because the Windows phone data is not uh, at high enough volumes to, to be able to do that for individual roads. You could try to get some sense overall of, say, the entire uh, the downtown Seattle region or something, but you don't, we don't have enough data to really be able to focus on and get uh, great uh, information about real-time traffic conditions on individual roads. If, um, there are some companies that do have access to data at that scale, but, but we did not. Uh, the statistical approach uh, needs to be able to give informed predictions for parts of the road network that don't have very much data, okay, like rural areas. Our approach, uh, captures, again, captures weekly cycles and congestion levels. And it, it needs to be extremely computationally efficient because this needs to work on continental scale road networks. Uh, we also have to accurately capture uh, the probabilistic dependence between driving time on different uh, road segments in the same trip. And this is important because it turns out if, that there's a strong positive correlation between driving speed on the first road in, the, in your trip and the second road in your trip, even after controlling for, a, uh, for observed traffic conditions and so on. 
Okay, and that's because, uh, for example, some drivers just drive more quickly than others. Uh, there's also effects due to the fact that we don't perfectly observe traffic conditions. So uh, the effect is that if we get high uh, measured speed on the first half of the trip, we're likely to have high measured speed on the second half of the trip. And we have to take these sorts of effects into account as we do prediction in order to avoid under predicting the variability. Okay, to our knowledge, we're the first to provide accurate predictions of reliability of driving time uh, for complete and large-scale road networks like the ones that are used in, in uh, mapping services. So again, the data sources is uh, location pings from mobile phones. But we have to convert, before we can start fitting a statistical model associated with roads, we have to match that to the road network. So the first step is a pre-processing step where we are estimating what route was taken by the trip in the data set and how much time was spent on each uh, road segment in that trip. Okay, so when I say link here, I'm referring to the link in the road network, which means the road segment between two intersections. Okay, so uh, there's lots of different methods that can be used in this step, uh, but the upshot is at the end of the day, for every trip, and let's index the trips by little i, for every trip in the historical data set, uh, we have the estimated route, which is a sequence of network uh, network links, so road segments in that route, and then also the distance that we traversed on each, uh, each link in that route. Okay, at the, and the first link of the route and the last link of the route, we may not traverse the whole, the whole link. Okay, so that's why we need to estimate the distance traversed on each link. And finally, we need an estimate of how much time we spent on each link uh, in, that, in that route. Okay, so then from here, we're gonna go on and pretend as though uh, these estimates are precise, okay? You might ask, well, why not take into account your uncertainty from this stage as you do your estimation in the next stage? The answer is that we have done that in a formal way. It didn't help much in terms of accuracy, uh, and it's also quite computationally intensive, so it doesn't scale well to these large road networks. So, uh, the method that I'll uh, propose is called TRIP. It's actually short for uh, travel time reliability. That's a typo. Travel time reliability inference and prediction. And uh, we take the, the driving time of TRIP I on the kth segment of that trip, and we model it as the ratio of several factors. In the numerator, is just the distance traveled on that link. So all we're doing is converting from time into speed here. So focus on the denominator here, which is our model for the driving speed uh, on this particular road segment. Okay, we model that speed as the product of two uh, latent factors. The first is the trip level effect, and the second is a link level effect. So what we're doing is we're decomposing variability into variability that occurs at the trip level and variability that occurs at the local or link level. So I'm gonna make some very specific parametric assumptions here. The model is actually a little bit more flexible than this, but for, for um, concreteness, uh, we can say, for example, that EI, the trip, of, trip level speed effect, uh, has a log normal distribution. This turns out to be a pretty good assumption for the Seattle data. Um, and that this this random variable capturing link level variability also has a log normal distribution once we condition on an unobserved congestion state for that link, okay? So we assume that the congestion state takes one of a finite number of values. For the Seattle analysis, we actually just use two congestion states, which works quite well, congested, uncongested. But conceptually speaking, you could certainly have more than two uh, but conditional on the congestion state and on the link, uh, we assume a log normal distribution for this random variable with an unknown mean and variance, which are allowed to depend on what link is that, which road segment are we talking about, and uh, what is the congestion state. Okay, but so this is almost the entire model. All we need is the model for the congestion states, right? These unobserved. Uh, congestion states Q, and we use a model which incorporates probabilistic dependence across the links of the trip. 
Okay, so in particular, we use a one-dimensional Markov model for these congestion states. So the, the probabilities, the parameters of that Markov model are going to depend on uh, what road it is and also what time of the week it is. Okay, so this is how we're capturing weekly cycles and congestion levels. Okay, so we take the, the week and we actually manually bin into a set of time bins that define things like morning rush hour, evening rush hour, uh, late night, and so on. And we allow these parameters of the Markov model to depend on the time bin of the week. So there's some initial probability of congestion and then some probability of transitioning uh, between congestion states. And these probabilities and transition probabilities are allowed to depend again on what link it is and what time of the week it is. This uh, model implies a normal mixture model for the, for the log of the driving time, okay? And that's important because when we look at the data, we see a bimodal behavior. Uh, and here I'm showing, I'm focusing on the five road segments in the network, in the Seattle network that have the highest volume of data, okay? The first, I've actually gotten the two highest volume uh, road segments that are highways and then the two that are uh, arterial roads and then the highest volume major road just for diversity. And you can see that the histogram is the, the, the log of the driving times for evening rush hour, okay? Um, and even when we restrict to a particular time of the week, like evening rush hour, we still see this bimodal behavior in driving times and it's very important that we capture that in our model. Um, and, and we seem to be doing that effectively. So the, the curve here is the estimated density uh, from our model and it, and it roughly matches the distribution of the observations, yeah? Have you been able to maybe tease apart the bimodality as being related to the fact that it's people trying to turn right and the, the right lane is backed up some, some blocks and things like that? And that's an excellent point. And actually, that, that is part of what's going on here. Um, I was not going to go to Bray's paradox. Yeah, yeah Bray's yeah. paradox. It's, well, no, 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 just the fact that in Seattle you often have that, like, Madison Avenue will be backed up, and if everyone who's trying to get on I-5 is backed up right. some blocks, right. so if you're going straight, then you can go through. Yeah. So, so, yes, if in the simplest case where you're, you're at the road segment that's just before an intersection, uh, part of this effect is definitely due to whether you're taking a left or going straight, and you can, man, you can actually redefine the road segments to account for the fact that you're turning left or going straight or going right, but in fact it doesn't fix this problem entirely, somewhat surprisingly. And the reason is because, uh, in fact, this, this effect can back up for more than one road segment. So if you think about, if you're on um, Highway 520 going west in, in Redmond and, and um, you have the option of going north on 405 or south on 405, so in other words, a highway coming into an interchange with another highway, you can have kind of backed up traffic conditions due to the fact that you're trying to take an exit half a mile down the road. And it's very hard to kind of distinguish that manually um, how, and, and thus account for this multimodality in an explicit way. Okay, so, so um, the, we do computation so, so we have to be very careful about how we do computation in this setting. We want to make sure to do shrinkage in all of the important ways, right? So that means that we want to try to, um, well, okay, so, so we, need to, we need to do some shrinkage, which means we need to do some, uh, some bring in some Bayesian ideas, uh, but we can't run a huge Markov chain here. Uh, so we do maximum a posteriori estimation, and we do it very carefully, uh, so that we get an expectation conditional maximization algorithm that has closed form updates in each iteration. And we really need those closed form updates because we have to be super, super efficient. When we do that, we, we get a very effective algorithm. Um, but that means that, for example, we have to be careful about what we're maximizing over and what we are integrating over. So here, we instead of just maximizing over the conditional density of the unknown parameters given the, the observed data, we actually include these trip level effects in that vector and we maximize over them instead of integrating over them. And that allows us to get these closed form updates. Um, it also turns out that there's not as much uncertainty about these quantities as there are about these so that it's a pretty good approximation. So in practice, as we think about computational versus and statistical trade-offs in, in accuracy, I think often the way that we account for this in practice is we pick a statistical model where we can do efficient computation um, rather than trying to fix the computational method after we've specified a too complex statistical model. 
So again, the big picture, we use expectation conditional maximization, and we, we do this in such a way we get nice closed form updates. Uh, and the estimation time is just 15 minutes without utilizing parallelization. The algorithm can be parallelized in a very effective way. We haven't yet done that, but even with that, we're able to, to do very efficient uh, estimation step. And then the prediction time has to be uh, basically 50 milliseconds or less, at least, if we want to use this for mapping services um, in practice. And, and we do hit that bar. So it's about 15 milliseconds for uh, prediction. You might argue that we don't have to worry so much about the estimation time, that it's okay that the estimation time is a little a little longer than this, but I would say no, it's important to keep that, the, the estimation time down as well because in practice, as we're trying to improve the model, uh, if we have a very long estimation time, it makes it difficult to, to um, iterate on the, on the quality of the model. Yeah. Are you doing exact predictions? Because I had a trip that was rather long with many links, mm -hmm. and you had to compute it essentially to run some hours on full HMM. Uh, yeah, it's just a forward backward error. It's actually really and fast. It's in 15 milliseconds. Yep. But how long is it? It's only like 5, 10 minutes or something. Oh, like the, trips, uh, the trips are typically. I, I don't know how many on average, but some, I think something like 20 links on average. These are not very long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just to give some results, uh, this is again the Seattle case study. I'm focusing first on three particular routes in the road network that happen to have lots of a high volume of data just to see what happens. Um, but again, our goal is to do prediction for the entire road network, which is a much, much harder problem. And here, we basically get the distributions uh, roughly correct. Okay, we have the, we capture the long right tail in driving times. This is in the, on the test data. Uh, the, the curve is the predictive density. Again, just restricting to evening rush hour. Um, we get the variability about right and the centering about right. Uh, we capture bimodality. Uh, in, in the cases where it occurs. Um, you, you know, these predictions, are they perfect? They're, no, they're not as good as if we were to do a non-parametric estimation focusing exactly on this particular route. But again, the problem really is at a much larger scale than this. And think that what we're trying to obtain is a really effective engineering solution here, not, not a solution that's perfect uh, for a, a small number of high volume routes. Right? So I would say, I would argue that this is, this is quite good for our purposes. Um, so just to compare to some on the entire test data set, which is 36,000 vehicle trips in the Seattle metropolitan region, um, we compare to the prediction method that was developed by Microsoft called ClearFlow. It's used in uh, Bing Maps. And also to uh, a simple approach based on linear regression of the whole trip driving time uh, on several uh, explanatory variables, including the route distance, uh, the law, the time bin, and so on. So a very simple linear regression on the whole trip, travel time. Uh, so here I'm showing uh, the empirical coverage of predictive intervals. On the x-axis, the theoretical coverage. On the y-axis, the empirical coverage. So what percentage, for what percentage of test trips did the actual driving time fall within, uh, say, a 95% interval or a 90% interval? And so what we're looking for here is we want the curves to follow the y equals x line. Um, and there's only two methods that do that successfully. One is TRIP, our method, and the other is this linear regression model. And it, it gets good coverage basically because it's modeling at the whole TRIP level. It gets the amount of variability about right. So that's why it looks good according to this measure. But all of these other approaches like Microsoft's method, ClearFlow really, ClearFlow really um, dramatically underestimates the amount of variability in driving time. That's because it's assuming independence of driving time across the lengths of the TRIP. Okay. Um, and, but it's also important to notice that even if you have two methods that have good coverage of predictive intervals, if you have, if one of the two methods has narrower predictive intervals on average, then that method is taking better advantage of information in the data to do, to give a precise prediction, right? So this numerical measure is looking at what's the average width of the predictive intervals. Um, again, for different coverages for the predictive intervals. So 95% intervals over here, for example. And basically, our predictive intervals are about 15% narrower than those from linear regression. And that's because we capture some the features in the data more effectively, like this bimodality. Also, looking at the 
the accuracy of deterministic predictions. So we still can get a single number for driving time as a prediction. And in, uh, in this case, what we do is we take the geometric mean of the distribution because these are heavily right skewed. Uh, and then we look at the accuracy of those deterministic predictions on the test data. So basically, all of the methods do about the same, except that linear regression does considerably worse. Uh, it's quite a rough method, again. Um, but our method gets about 10.4% uh, error for deterministic predictions. Okay? And due to random variability in driving times, again, you can't get to zero for these, for these predictions. Right? Um, ClearFlow, Microsoft's method, does slightly better. And the reason is because ClearFlow is designed for deterministic, high quality deterministic prediction. And it uses hundreds of explanatory variables that we're not yet incorporating into our model. So it's definitely something that we want to do in the future. But it's interesting that despite the fact that ClearFlow is using hundreds of explanatory variables that we're not taking into account, we get almost as precise in, term, in terms of the deterministic predictions as ClearFlow. Um, oh, I do just want to point out a fun tidbit, which is that after we started publicizing the, uh, our method in January, Google Maps introduced a, uh, an interval a range of driving times on the Google Maps interface. So if you go onto Google Maps uh, web interface, then you type in an origin and a destination, and then uh, specify a future time, then it'll give you a range for driving times now instead of a single number. To conclude, we've introduced methods for probabilistic prediction of driving time uh, for arbitrary routes in a road network, and um, shown it has quite, quite accurate predictions. Uh, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.